You may have heard someone wonder out loud whether someone's newly discovered behavior is from nature or nurture. For example, seeing a child showing promise on a new instrument or in playing a sport. Anytime we see someone doing exceptionally well when taking on a new challenge, it's common to wonder where that talent could have come from. Is it nature or nurture? Is the question. Meaning, was the skill found in their genes, or did it come from being raised in a supportive environment? As we saw in our previous episode, all behaviors are a combination of both genetic and environmental influences, and it is never one or the other. This question of asking whether Johnny's guitar-playing ability is due to his nature or nurture is a false dichotomy, because it is always both. We cannot have an animal behavior without also having the underlying machinery that codes for its production. These are rooted in the genetic causes. But of course, no gene products could ever lead to a successful behavior without interacting with external stimuli and substrates from the environment. An acorn contains all the potential to become a towering oak tree. But it will never do so without the benefit of light, water, nutrients, and avoiding squirrels. The same is true for animal behaviors. They must involve an interaction between the underlying proximate mechanisms and the environmental stimuli that will make the behaviors effective in the real world. In this episode, we will explore how behaviors are created and controlled by our genes, nerves and neurons, hormones, and any sensory systems that enable animals to interact with their environments in ways that allow them to maximize their fitness and to promote survival and reproduction over evolutionary time. Because different behaviors can be impacted upon at any of these aforementioned proximate levels, we see that even relatively simple animals can perform reasonably complex behaviors when the different proximate factors kick in as they interact with the different stimuli from the environment. Honeybees are insects, and as such, they're often considered to be simple, basic animals that go through life thoughtlessly reacting to the world around them. However, these little worker bees are capable of fulfilling a rich behavioral repertoire throughout their lives, even specializing in some behaviors at certain points in their life before moving on to different roles. Early on in a worker bee's existence, they are housebound in the hive and perform a series of behaviors related to housekeeping and nursing, like cleaning the brood cells and feeding their larva siblings. As the number of workers in the hive grows, the chemical profile of the colony changes as a result, and this causes a genetic shift in some of those older worker bees. Provoked by the change in their chemical environment, the genes in those workers that are responsible for the nursing behaviors switch off and other genes switch on instead. This second suite of genes has the effect of changing the behavior in the older nursing bees to become foraging bees and to leave the hive in search of nectar and pollen to feed their growing colony family. What seemed like complex behavior switching at first glance is controlled largely by simple gene-environment interactions that have evolved in such a way that they make the individual bees behave adaptively in the interest of their greater family needs. Although these bees are performing an impressive range of complex behaviors, much of the control came directly from the genes involved and did not require much development time or learning for them to be performed effectively. In many higher animals, behaviors may also involve a process of learning, 
which also has the effect of allowing behaviors to be adaptable and flexible to different situations that may arise. In many bird species, the ability to know what kind of bird they are is learned at a very early age through a process of imprinting, where they associate themselves as being like the first animals they learn to know in life. In nature, these first acquaintances are usually the parents of the young chicks, but we have seen strange side effects of imprinting with geese that think that they're humans because they were raised by a farmer instead of a mother goose. Clearly, imprinting would seem to be an effective way of learning what species of bird you are, but if it is too rigid and leads to geese thinking that they're humans, for example, then that would have some devastating effects when it comes time for reproduction. Sooner or later, someone is in for a big disappointment. Honk, honk, honk. The fact that imprinting is rooted in the genetics of the species of bird and that it varies from species to species is strong evidence to support that even learned behaviors are not purely environmentally formed and that the underlying proximate mechanisms are a crucial component as well. A clever way to tease apart the relative contributions of genetic versus environmental influences on learning come from what are known as cross-fostering experiments, where the chicks of one species are raised in the nest with another species' parents, and vice versa. This can be done with very closely related birds, like those found in the chickadee-like birds in Europe that are known as tits. Researchers raised the fancifully named great tit chicks in nests of the blue tit parents, and vice versa for the blue tit chicks. By comparing their ability to recognize themselves as the correct species later in adult life, shows that great tit chicks are much more constrained by their genes for learning and almost none of them manage to identify as the right species following the cross-fostering upbringing. This was not so for the blue tit chicks, who still managed to court and mate their own species later in life, demonstrating that their genetic constraints on learning were looser and able to be more flexible in the learning process. Although learning is in part under genetic control, it does represent a way for greater environmental influence to bear on the development of a behavior. Learning is particularly important for behaviors that need to work effectively in unpredictable environments, where one needs to track and assess aspects of the environment that will be important for the proper functioning of certain behaviors. The species differences in learning abilities for imprinting are not the only ways that birds may differ in their abilities to learn. Many birds stash food in caches and need to remember the locations of hundreds of food sites in the ground or in tree cavities. These birds are exceptional learners of this spatial information that they need to remember to survive the winters. Because evolution would favor learning as a behavioral flexibility only when it is adaptive, it is normal to see some species that haven't evolved it because of a lack of need. Equally, even within species, when some individual members have a greater need for learning than others, we find that evolution has tailored their behaviors to match those needs too. In the pinion jay birds, it is the males only who gather food in the form of nuts and seeds and he stashes them throughout the environment to ensure a long-term food supply while the female tends mostly to the nest activities and caring for the offspring. As such, the male's ability to learn spatial information needed for remembering and locating stashed food is vastly better than that of the females because he is the one who needs those behavioral skills. And for the female pinion jays, their world is much more predictable, and therefore evolution has not favored the need for them to learn extensively throughout their lives by comparison. In other circumstances, the environment can be so predictable that it leads to behaviors that are performed perfectly the very first time they are triggered by the appropriate environmental stimulus. These kinds of behaviors are known as instincts. 
in which complex and highly adaptive behaviors may be stimulated by the simplest of environmental cues, as long as they carry the appropriate biologically relevant context with them. Such as the herring gull chicks that instinctively peck at the red spot on their parent's beak until they get fed. We must presume that the chick can't help itself and doesn't really know why it feels compelled to peck at the red dot, but it happens to have the effect of provoking the parent into regurgitating some food to satisfy the little pecker. This red dot acts as an innate releasing mechanism, triggering the instinctive behavior in the chick, which in turn activates a parental response of care and feeding. It happens to work pretty well, despite the lack of any behavioral flexibility on either the chick or the parent's behalf. The origin of the red signal may have been linked to another innate response of young animals to redness because it most often represents food in the form of meat in their environment. The adoption of the signal into the parent-offspring communication is adaptive because it allows that same food association to be used in this new context of receiving it directly from the parent. Either way, it works, and it shows how behaviors do not need to be flexible as long as they work. The inability of the gull chick to resist pecking at red would be maladaptive if all of the pebbles in its habitat were also blood red, but that's not the case. Here, redness implies food, and it makes sense for a young animal to peck at what it needs to eat to survive. Because the need to feed as a newborn or for parents to care for their offspring are so important in some animal species, those behaviors become somewhat pre-programmed as innate or instinctive behaviors that the animals just can't help themselves from doing. In most cases, it ensures the survival of the individual and evolution has strongly favored the retention of these crucial behaviors in some animals. However, behaviors that lack flexibility cannot adjust those instinctive behaviors when contexts change or even manipulated by others. This last fact is fully exploited by code breakers, or organisms that use other animals' innate behaviors against them, much to the benefit of the code breaker species themselves. This is perfectly exemplified by nest parasite birds, species such as cuckoos and brown-headed cowbirds who lay their eggs in the nest of other bird species for these adoptive parents to take care of instead of themselves. By forcing other birds to care for their young, these nest parasites can maximize their own reproductive success by having many more offspring than they could have if they would have needed to care for them all by themselves. From the point of view of the parasitized bird parent, who needs to triple down on feeding expeditions to keep up with the demand of a huge and unfamiliar bird chick in her nest, despite losing all of her own chicks when they were pushed out of the nest by the parasite, well, it hardly seems fair. Sure, that surrogate parent may think that they've scored the reproductive payoff by somehow producing the biggest chick their species has ever produced. But in reality, they may run themselves ragged by trying to find enough food to feed this chick with the needs of a whole brood of its own offspring. We may ask ourselves how evolution would favor blindly caring for any offspring in our midst, even if it should be clearly obvious to be a ruse or an evolutionary trick that is steering us away from our own reproductive duties. The thing is, that parental care is so inherently strong in many species of animals, particularly birds and mammals, that in some cases we can't help but to care for a young one in need, even when it doesn't seem right for some reason. Of course, the only way that this parental manipulation could work is because it is relatively rare, and that natural selection still favors birds caring for offspring in their nests. Surely if nest parasitism were much more common, natural selection would steer some adult birds towards behaviors that allow them to be neglecting young in their nests. However, this would certainly have maladaptive effects, as some of that neglect 
would inevitably be directed towards young of their own species as well. Clearly, these code-breaking scenarios only work by occasionally taking advantage of a situation that has evolved to work for most animals most of the time. What we have been seeing so far is that reasonably complex behaviors do not need to have correspondingly complex proximate machinery within to make those behaviors possible, and that they can be triggered by very simple stimuli in the environment as well. In fact, in evolutionary terms, less is more, such that when a simple plan can lead to an effective behavioral solution, those will prevail. Many insects are active at night, as an adaptation to avoid the predator-rich times during daylight. However, one group of mammal predators has found a way to hunt at night without the need to see using their eyes. Bats are nocturnal predators that use sounds to hunt, in particular high-frequency ultrasounds that allow them to navigate in the dark and locate their insect prey. Many nocturnal insects, such as these noctuid moths, survive these nighttime threats by using their ears, or tympanic membranes, that are sensitive to ultra-high frequency sounds only, to detect the oncoming bats and to find safety from their swooping attacks. When we look at the neurons that are hooked up to these important hearing aids for the moths, we may be surprised to see that there are only two nerve endings that receive information about lethal bats. However, these neurons are fine-tuned to the exact frequency of the bat ultrasounds and are sensitive to different sound intensities, low and high. This simple setup allows the moths not only to detect the presence of bats hunting with ultrasound nearby, but the two neurons fire differently when the bats are near or far. Furthermore, because they have one tympanic membrane on each side of the body, the moths can tell which direction the bat may be coming from, and whether it is approaching from above, below, or behind, based on the muting effects that the wings would have when blocking the sound from its direction of travel. When the high-intensity neurons are firing, the moths know that danger is imminent, and they take evasive action by dropping to the ground where they are away from the diving arcs of the predatory bats. The setup for the moth hearing apparatus is extremely simple, but effective in providing the kind of information that they need to know to survive in the nights around hunting bats. Evolution has a way of tailoring the animal's nervous systems in ways that allow them to sense the features of the world that are biologically relevant to them. In this past case, the frequency of ultrasound is about the most important sound that nocturnal moths need to be able to sense. As biologists, we therefore need to be extra careful to take into account the sensory biases of the animals we're studying. That is, to try to know how they are sensing the world around them so that we may try to understand how and why they are behaving the way that they do. Because every animal will differ in how its nervous system is built, each one will experience the world in a different way, with its own sensory bias. Insects and flowers have co-evolved together for 125 million years and flowers have developed numerous ways to communicate their presence to pollinating insects and to advertise their attractive food rewards. Among these attractive messages from flowers to insects are petal shapes, bouquets of odors, and remarkable colors that allow flowers to be located by the insect pollinators. The thing is that insects see the world in a vastly different way than we do as humans. We both have trichromatic vision, meaning that our eyes have three different types of color receptors. In our case, it is red, green, and blue receptors. Insects are also trichromatic in their vision, but with green, blue, and ultraviolet receptors. This means that insects can see reflective patterns in UV when we can't. And flowers have taken advantage of this sense by sending them colorful messages that are only visible in the UV spectrum, 
one that the insects use as part of their regular sensory detection apparatus. We as humans may tend to think that flowers are ours alone to appreciate, on our kitchen tables in a vase, or as a gift to a valentine date. However, they have evolved to communicate messages to insects, not humans, and so, just like these flowers, they use the bandwidths that insects are using as part of their pre-existing sensory bias. If we are unable to know how animals are sensing the world around them, we may often fail to understand how and why they are behaving the way that they do. Many animals, from fish to birds and reptiles, can see in the UV spectrum and make important behavioral decisions based on information in this sensory realm, such as mate evaluation, for example. We must attempt to see the world as animals do in order to make sense of their behaviors. There's an expression, making a beeline for a destination, which implies a quick and direct route. It's named after bees for a good reason, because many hundreds of workers leave the nest each day and meander about finding flowers to feed in, but once they need to get back to the hive, they seem capable of going directly over unknown terrain, always knowing where they are heading. How do animals navigate the world and cover ground for the first time as if they've got Google Maps built into their sensory system? Their nervous systems must be tuned to some aspects of the physical environment around them that allows them to travel around without getting lost. It turns out that there are many environmental cues that can be used by animals to read the geography of their habitats and to allow them to get their bearings. One such cue that is reliable as clockwork is the daily movement of the sun across the sky. Many animals that travel over great distances during the day are suspected of using the sun as a marker in the sky to let them know where they're going. However, the catch here is that the sun is also moving through the skyscape and any animals that are navigating with the sun would also have to keep track of the time of day. It turns out that they do. At least, it has been shown to be the case with homing pigeons. Researchers bred pigeons under two different light regimes. One normal one, like the regular timing of day and night cycles. The other group was raised under a phase shift in the photo period, in which their sunrise and sunset were offset by six hours from normal. The two groups of birds were taken to a location away from the roost and released to see how they managed to navigate their way back home. The normally scheduled birds flew home in the correct westerly direction, but the phase-shifted birds flew north, a full 90 degrees off their target direction. But remember, they were phase-shifted by six hours, and since the sun moves 15 degrees through the sky per hour, then a six-hour shift would give them the impression that they would need to make a 90 degree adjustment to their orientation. And they did, confirming that they are using the sun to navigate and tracking time too, so that they can adjust their direction as the sun moves through the sky. The sun is an obvious and reliable cue from the environment that can be used by animals to track both space and time. But what about those animals that travel at night? The sun is not available at that time to help navigate, so they must use different cues. Some green sea turtles will swim thousands of kilometers at night from their feeding grounds off the east coast of Brazil to their breeding grounds at Ascension Island in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean some 2,000 kilometers away. How are they capable of achieving such specific navigation at night? In other words, what environmental cues are they using as a map? They can't rely on the sun, and there's no oceanic currents that run continuously across their travel axis. These nocturnally navigating animals do so by following the magnetic lines that cover our planet. We know this now through the use of phase-shifting experiments again. When green sea turtles are raised in captivity in tanks, they still exhibit the migratory behavior associated with traveling between the feeding and breeding grounds, but they just do it by swimming in the direction of their destination inside their tanks. 
When we wrap electromagnetic coils around the turtle tanks, it allows researchers to change their perceived location on Earth when they send a current through them. When the turtles are tricked into thinking that they are either to the north or south of their actual location, it predictably changes the direction that they swim to where they perceive their destination to be. This shows that the sea turtles are tapping into the Earth's electromagnetic surface map to satisfy their navigation needs across thousands of kilometers of ocean at night. Again, we have seen that animals will track environmental cues that are of relevance to their own biological needs. Although it is important for animals to respond to stimuli from the environment, not all behaviors are adaptive to perform at all times, and in many instances, animals will have to switch between one behavior and another as competing stimuli are encountered. For example, the green sea turtles that are navigating at night using the Earth's electromagnetic waves will undoubtedly switch from their unidirectional travel if they come face to face with a predatory shark. At that point, it would make sense to change to an evasive behavior, which then becomes the priority so that they may live to see their breeding grounds again someday. So most animal behaviors are not just governed by on-off switches, and there's often a range of behaviors that animals may undertake at different times in different contexts. As such, we note that there are some times and places where and when certain behaviors should take place, and others where and when they shouldn't. Female Teleogrylus crickets hide under leaves during the day and emerge to feed at night only, when it's safer with fewer predators around. For this reason, the male crickets also wait until dusk to start their calling behaviors, in which they're looking to court the females for reproduction at night. Clearly this courtship calling behavior would not be adaptive for the males during the day, if the females would not be receptive to their flirtations at that time, and they would surely be making themselves more conspicuous to the many predators hunting in the day. How do these males keep track of time so that they can perform their calling behaviors roughly every 24 hours or so? An obvious suggestion is that they have some kind of internal biological clock that also cycles around 24 hours. To verify this, researchers have put normally dusk calling males into growth chambers with constant 24-hour light to see if the behavior still continues along its cycle independent of the changes from environmental stimuli. Interestingly, the males do continue calling every day on an approximately 25 or 26 hour cycle, so it eventually becomes out of sync with the Earth's natural day-night periods and seems to be free-running on its own. This means that the behavior has an environmentally independent component because it continues running on schedule without cues from the environment on an approximately circadian rhythm. However, when the lights are switched back to a regular 12-hour day and 12-hour night, the behavior gradually shifts back to become synced up with the stimuli coming from the environment. So, somehow, the behavior also has an environmentally dependent component too meaning that it also aligns itself with the regular cycling of cues from the environment. If we think about it, it makes sense for evolution to tailor a behavior that runs on a circadian rhythm to involve both environmentally dependent and independent factors, because on the one hand, it would ensure that the animal's bodies are primed and physiologically ready to perform the behavior every day, but also that they can make micro-adjustments to the timing of the behavior too. Given that the day length changes over the course of the seasons, it would be important to be able to synchronize the behavior with the changing environmental schedule, or else the crickets would become out of sync with nature over time. On approximate level, this simple experiment has shown that there must be some kind of internal mechanism that allows the calling behavior to be regulated on a circadian basis, but also to have a sensory system that can track the changes in day length from the outside. Upon investigation, 
we find a particular gene happens to have a regulation cycle that produces protein products for 12 hours and sends out hormones that circulate in cricket bodies, coinciding with the timing of the behaviors. Internally, there does seem to be a biological clock that communicates this genetically-based schedule to the rest of the body through hormonal chemical messages. However, to set the pacemaker of that biological clock, there would need to be a way for crickets to register the changes in the day length and to encode them internally to synchronize the hormonal cycle with the right time to refine the onset of the behaviors. For most animals, the eyes are the light-detecting organs and would make good candidates for the day-length sensing organs in this case as well. When male crickets have their eyes surgically disconnected from their brains, the animals start to develop a free-running 25- or 26-hour cycle to their calling behavior, which confirms that their eyes are involved in sensing the subtle changes and using that information to allow the brain to synchronize the timing of the internal and external schedules. The key link between the internal and external control of the behavior schedules are the hormones, whose production and degradation act as the chemical messengers telling the animals when to behave or not. From a Darwinian perspective, survival is the means to an end, and the ultimate goal is to reproduce sexually and to pass along one's genes to the next generation. However, reproduction is not a behavior that can happen at just any time in an animal's life. There are many factors that will go into when sexual reproduction can happen, not least of which is that it will be impossible before the animal is sexually mature in the first place. On top of that, there will be environmentally dependent factors that will dictate when it is the best time to reproduce, such as the seasonal cycles, which affect habitat use and resource availability, to name a few. And lastly, it is crucial that an animal makes its attempts at reproduction when the other sex is also ready and available too or they may find it to be a lonely prospect. For all these reasons, hormones will also be important in animal reproduction, especially the sex hormones that are responsible for preparing the animals for sex and reproduction. In male animals, the main sex hormone for sexual readiness and behavior is testosterone. Not only does testosterone promote sperm production and sexual activity, but it also increases aggressiveness in male behavior. This increased aggression can be helpful in male reproductive strategies by helping them to increase their social rank among males and to pursue females more effectively among all the competition. Although testosterone brings about great benefits to males in the competitive arena of courting and securing females for reproduction, it does come with some significant costs as well. The physiological effect of testosterone on male animal bodies has an immunosuppressive effect and can make them more susceptible to diseases and developmental defects. If you add to this all of the stupid things that those male animals do as a result of their testosterone-driven aggression, like falling down flights of stairs as they attempt to slide a skateboard down the handrail, believe me, my younger self knows the painful reality of that stupidity. Well, needless to say that male animals can pay a price for the flow of testosterone in their systems. For all these reasons, we find that, generally speaking, male animals will not have high levels of testosterone in their bodies at all times. It is low in juveniles who are not sexually mature, but even in adult males, the concentrations fluctuate to coincide with the need for aggressive and sexual behaviors. Otherwise, the price would be too high and a male animal that is jacked on testosterone all the time would not survive for long, as it would constantly be fighting and spending its energy too fast, too soon. When we look at male animals as they prepare for breeding behaviors, such as territoriality and courtship, their testosterone levels rise predictably to prime their bodies and behaviors for the challenges and benefits of sexual reproduction. Once that act has been achieved, however, we typically find a drop in the amount of testosterone 
back to the previous baseline levels. This not only saves some unnecessary wear and tear on the male animals by avoiding futile acts of territoriality or courtship and to spare the immune system from further stress. In addition, it will allow these previously aggressive males to settle down and adopt a more nurturing demeanor for those that are going to be around to help raise their young and to transition into the parenting mode of behaviors that will be required of them to ensure a continued successful reproduction via the survival of their offspring. As we conclude our tour of the proximate factors that make animals behave how and when that they do, we note that there's no one-size-fits-all approach. In fact, there are many variations on the theme of how animals keep track of the environment around them and link the cues of biological relevance to their internal functioning and behavioral schedules. Because no two animals are built in exactly the same way, we need to consider the kind of sensory information that they're using to interpret the world around them. And knowing this allows us to have a key that will unlock a door to their perception and to help us understand their behaviors a little bit better in the process.